I just want to show you why we think in our department a cage standalone is not the gold standard for fusion in a cervical with a, combined with a cervical discectomy. In my department, Dr. Ottenbacher, he is one of my co-workers. He is very much involved in that subject. And since 2006, I think, all of our patients that we do cervical surgery on, all the data are given anonymously in the European Spine Cent uh, Register Center. So all of our patients will have an evaluation before and after at certain stages. So we get all the data from all these patients. So we have a quite good data. Uh, analysis and uh, it's always the discussion on spine surgeons uh, not for the indications of the ACDF I'm speaking about anterior cervical discectomy and fusion but whether cage standalone is sufficient or if you need any plating for that as well so that is what the discussion is going about interbody graft of course none I don't think that anybody's doing so I could escape to me just leaving it like this and not putting in a graft I, I don't know how it is in India putting in nothing so that was the former times bone. yeah bone is is absolutely okay bone makes a very good fusion absolutely but I would say in Europe they people will not accept to have uh, you know bone taken off from the alia crest and often you have a lot of problems from that so people would not go for that so then we had the PMMA bone cement error but this doesn't make any good fusion we use now peak and we fill the peak with uh, bone material that we take you know from our procedure we don't take it we don't take artificial bone I do not believe in this from companies you get some artificial bone things that should make a fusion I do not really believe on that we use the peak and then the question is if you come an anterior plating or not the thing is we will speak about it what is the reason for cervical plane fixation? Why should you use a plate instead of a cage standalone? This is put in the cage standalone, how we started with six weeks after, two years after fusion. Very good result. And you have many of these patients where it is good. But you have patients like this, post-op, the same good result. Six weeks later, you see what we call the, you say, subsidence. Yeah, subsidence. And I know that a lot of people in Germany say subsidence, you often see it, but it doesn't matter. Most of the patients have no complaints. And this is not true. If you carefully go for the patients, you will see that a lot of these patients have at least local neck pain. And this is something where often doctors just say, this is nothing local, but local neck pain. This can be really bothersome for the patient. Local neck pain, and this, how it looks like two years later, you have a pseudoarthrosis, the foramina are narrowed again. This patient has the same complaints he had before, and this has not healed. So the question is, will it do any better if you use a plate or not? And these are some conclusions from papers who did biomechanics on that side, and they found out that standalone cage has a significantly higher range of motion than healthy spine. There's a significant risk of subsidence, in vitro studies suggest the use of the plate, but no prospective clinical studies are available. So why should you worry about the subsidence? The first is you have a loss of the re-established lordosis, and that is the thing where I think grafting usually should be done. You said some people do not put anything in spondylosis. It may be okay if it's so fused by itself, by the nature, then it may work. But otherwise, I think it's very important to re-establish the lordosis. The second is you want to increase the disc height in the degenerative disc disease and if you have the cage standalone you may have a loss of the disc height and then the restenosis of the foramina and then the third problem is be the non-fusion which makes a lot of pain so that are the ideas why subsidence I think should be avoided if it's possible and then we had made at the beginning when we started with the cages in 2005 we had a follow-up to 2006 of 90 pre of about 83 patients out of 92 and then we started using the plate as well and just compared our results using the plate or not and what we found out look here what is the difference in subsidence 62 percent cage standalone just 18 percent by using an anterior plate uh, as well symptomatic not all of them were symptomatic but 39 percent just seven with uh, using the plate Redo surgery, again, a big significant difference. Pseudarthrosis is a big difference, and the fusion rate 
was higher using an interior plate instead of the standalone cage. So a couple of factors that are clearly in favor of using an anterior plate as well. And that's how we use it. We're not using uh, bicortical screws. I think it's sufficient if you use monocortical screws, but they should be um, at least 80% of the vertebral body should be affected. We use uh, the dynamic plates and complications are the same if you use the peak cage or anterior plating, very low a complication rate. And this is the conclusion got from our data. By using not only a cage but an anterior plate, this prevents cage dislocation. It reduces the rate of painful subsidence. It enhances the rate of fusion. Cervical collar is not necessary and it doesn't make any artifacts in CT or MRI. On the other hand, of course, you have a prolonged time of surgery and some higher costs. We do about 250 cervical surgeries a year in my department, so it's pretty lot. We're still doing dorsal foraminotomy. Fabiz, I don't know how you call it. We call it from the European neurosurgeon, call it Fabiz. Fabiz is his name. But you know that the dorsal foraminotomy, you know the technique. For soft lateral disc herniations, for me, still the best, best results. You don't do anything on the, on the motion of the segment. You don't have to fuse anything. It's very good for soft uh, lateral disc herniations. But otherwise, of course, we have to do it oh, entirely. This is the kind of uh, cage we use now. We've got another one, but uh, there are peak cages, and this is how it looks like with a plate. Just want to show you complications for plate fixation. The technical recommendation, that's the last point I would just to stress. Accurate resection of the spondylotic prominences. But what should be aware is you should sh use the shortest plate that fits. If it's too long the plate and it comes to the next level, that is not good. X-ray during screw fixation may be helpful. Usually we don't do that. We just do an X-ray after we've put in the screws. You need divergent screw positioning in the sagittal plane and convergent screw positioning in the axial plane. That is something you have to be aware. And if you don't use an X-ray, you must have a feeling, if you have that segment for you, how to put in the screws. After a while you know it, how you get a good divergent a screw positioning in the saddle plane, but you must be careful not to put the screw into the next disc space. That would be bad. There's probably no advantage of bicortical screws, but what I said is monocortical screws have to enter up to 80% of the vertebral body death, depth, and in case of unsatisfied fixation of the screws, you can do a cement augmentation of the screws to give them that, that it's better fixed instead of using what we call the rescue screws. That's what we often do. Just put in some bony cement that it gets if you have to do a, a screw refixation. That's it.